A skill-based treatment process treats moderate to severe problem behavior. SBT is an educational process derived from the evidence-based principles of applied behavior analysis. SBT emphasizes treating problem behavior in a way that prioritizes the safety and dignity of all participants while creating strong relationships built on trust and compassion. The SBT process involves teaching a series of skills that, once learned, replace problem behavior. These skills are communication, tolerating disappointment, cooperating with directions from adults, and how to handle unexpected challenges. We teach learners how to thrive in chaos. They can succeed in those conditions. They can succeed anywhere. During this process, we teach from a place of joy. We want our learners to be happy, relaxed, and engaged when we teach. When we find this place of joy, there is no need for our clients to engage in any challenging behavior because we have met all of their needs. We are providing all of the suspected reasons why challenging behavior occurs, the things they love, the attention they like, and preventing the occurrence as much as possible of the things that occasion challenging behavior that they dislike. We establish a baseline that creates a space for safety, trust, and rapport, and happy, relaxed, and engaged. The practical functional assessment is composed of two parts. First, an interview, then an analysis. There are four main goals in the interview. First, to discover what creates joy for the individual. What makes them happy, relaxed, and engaged? What activities, items, attention, and more go together to create the most amazing condition ever, like Disneyland? Second, to discover what triggers challenging behavior. Is that work tasks, waiting while mom is on the phone, playing independently, losing a game, or something else? Third, to discover what behaviors we are targeting. Which behaviors are precursors, meaning a warning behavior like whining, crying, stomping, protesting, and which behaviors are high intensity or dangerous, like aggression, self-injury, and more. We think of these behaviors in these two classes. Finally, we want to discover what are the goals of, the, of and for the client. The first condition is our happy, relaxed, and engaged condition where all of the information we gathered from the interview is available. For example, an iPad, beanbag, someone's full attention, and we avoid any and all of their identified triggers. The second condition is a systematic progression away from the happy, relaxed, and engaged condition and into the ident identified triggers. Our goal is to progress into the triggers slowly and see one of the smaller precursor behaviors and then terminate the trigger, effectively turning off, or off the precursor behavior. We wanna see five repetitions of slow progression, a small behavior happening, stopping the trigger, and that small behavior immediately turning off. Once we have accomplished that goal, we can proceed to skill-based treatment. Once we achieve happy, relaxed, and engaged and complete an assessment to determine what triggers challenging behavior, we then begin to teach the skills of communication. We do this by teaching an omnibus band. This is a communication response that functions to tell us one, stop doing all of the things that I hate, and two, please do and give me all of the things that I love. This response could be my way or my choice, a chest tap, a button tap, or more, many of options there. The criteria for this process should be efficient. 
We want to see three to five correct responses in a row, independent, without challenging behaviors at this step, before we move on to the next step, toleration of denial. In this step, we teach our learners to hear a denial and accept it. After they admit the man, my way, we will say no, and then teach them to engage in a functional response as a replacement to challenging behavior in that moment such as a thumbs up, high five, that's cool, no, okay, or no problem. Once the learner has engaged in three to five consecutive independent and behavior-free trials at this step, we can move on to teaching them to relinquish their reinforcers. Now we are ready to teach our clients to relinquish their reinforcers. We do this by breaking down the steps we want them to engage in to give up the things they're playing with or to stop their current activities. For example, put the toys down, move that over here, stand up, and other directions might be provided. Again, we're looking for them to engage in this, these responses at this level three to five consecutive independent times with no challenging behaviors to move on to the next step, transitioning. Next, we teach our client to transition away from their highly preferred items and activities and transition to the area of high expectations to get ready to learn. The tasks they transition to are related to the triggers we identified in the beginning of this process, academics, hygiene, games, etc. These transitions can be from the floor to a desk, a video game to a dining room table, etc. Through the next steps of the process, we teach our client to engage in longer and longer periods of engagement with the activities and tasks that previously occasioned challenging behavior. These tasks are relevant to the goals our clients have for themselves and others have for them as well. We break these expectations into smaller chunks, teaching relevant skills within them. This is not a typical waiting program. Instead, we teach the learner to engage in contextually appropriate behavior, much like we would while delayed denial of access to HRE is expected. Once a client has mastered this chain, we then move to challenges. When we have a nice, long, beautiful, and challenging behavior-free chain of engagement with activities that are not related to the child-led context, then we begin to add in the complexities of life, like losing a game, getting an answer wrong, and more. These should be learner-specific. This process is effective for a number of reasons. First, throughout every step, we still return to early steps to reinforce. We might be working on challenges in the last level of the process, but sometimes when the client asks for their way, we say yes. Sometimes when they tolerate hearing no, we say yes. Sometimes when they do a little bit of cooperation, we say yes. This creates an element of unpredictability for the client, which means they are always hoping that reinforcement is about to happen. Second, we plan for generalization from the start. We create our plan based on the real life scenarios we want to get to, and we directly work on those scenarios. Then we systematically expand the client's repertoire with different scenarios, different people, and different places. Last, we approach this process with kindness. The learner determines through their performance, including when they engage in challenging behavior, whether each step has hit mastery. We program assent and consent withdrawal and we encompass the client in a truly therapeutic space and process, allowing them to have a voice in what happens to them during their therapy. What I love about this process is how values-driven it is. If you think about it, the individual elements on their own are nothing particularly new in the field of ABA. For example, shaping behavior has been studied and used in treatment for decades. What makes this process unique is the combination of intermittent unpredictable reinforcement, synthesized contingencies, shaping, along with the core values that drive the bus from the back to talk. So then what are these values? These values include safety, teaching from a place of joy or happy relaxed and engaged, trust and rapport building, as well as televisability. Safety is of the utmost importance for all people involved in the process. Gone are the days of where there's a badge of honor for working through challenging behavior and escalation. We stay safe by treating the less severe forms of challenging behavior that often precede more severe behavior 
and are of the same response class. We teach from a place of joy. We use synthesized reinforcement. The words happy, relaxed, and engaged are the foundations for which our analysis and treatment are built on. This is not simply pairing. This is the start of a relationship which allows for trust and rapport to become interwoven in the teaching process. Whether it is day one or day 100, implementers will be looking at the learner to see if they're HRE. We make it our assumption that our learners have experienced trauma both inside and outside their previous experiences of ABA therapy. We strive in this process to make sure to the best of our ability that we do not add more traumatic experiences to these histories. The term has been coined values over procedure. Now, this is not to say that there's no procedure involved with the practical functional assessment and skill-based treatment. What it means is that when you're making decisions, when you're analyzing next step possible steps, when you're troubleshooting, values always come first. And that is what I love about this process. Skill-based treatment replicates real-life conditions of unpredictability. We never really know when life will give us a high or a low, and often these are moments of challenge for the clients that we serve. When we program for behavior change, we need to ensure that our interventions can work in the real world and work for caregivers too. And this does. In real life, we do not carry around token boards, visual schedules, nor can caregivers do extinction or intensive behavior change procedures in public like the grocery store. Predicated on safety, this intervention is also parsimonious, systematic, and replicable. Imagine, Imagine never having to ask someone to work through an intense and dangerous extinction burst again, and the satisfaction that will come from outcomes without the use of those procedures. This values-based approach can help support retention goals by giving direct care staff clear, meaningful, safe, and fun strategies. It can also give clinicians evidence-based, effective, meaningful intervention tools to use for behavior change. At an organizational level, the outcomes can be determined based on the retention of staff, the reduction of resources like materials, training on crisis intervention, two-on-one staffing, and others the immediate impact of a decrease of, of incident reports and injuries to clients and staff, as well as happy clients who are achieving meaningful outcomes. This process is life-changing at every level for our client, support staff, clinical staff, supervising staff, caregivers, management, organizations, and even at the funder level, where outcomes which are promised are actually delivered and achieved. We hope you will consider taking the leap and trying skill-based treatment to see and experience this for yourself and achieve meaningful outcomes for the people that you serve. I'm Jesse and my son is Jaden and he is 11 years old. Life was rough. Um, everything was a big explosion with Jaden. His he couldn't handle anything as far as me going to work. Um, he would pretty much beat me up. Um, couldn't go to work. I couldn't leave the house without him going with me. And 
in that same aspect, I couldn't go anywhere with Jaden. So the only time I ever had was if somebody would watch him or, or he was sleeping or something because he would have meltdowns in the middle of the store over desired items that he couldn't have. Um, in therapy wise, things were just avoided. Um, so we made Jaden happy and not made him upset. So there was everything that was hard. We would just avoid, which was just putting a bandaid on it. Physical abuse, um, breaking things, trying to hurt me, um, throwing things, anything destructive. Yeah. He couldn't, in my mind, he couldn't see anything because he would just see red all the time. And he couldn't experience anything in his life. Couldn't go anywhere. He couldn't see anything. I believe that he was happy, but he didn't know much of anything. He didn't know what was out there to be disappointed about. And no, he didn't know... Um, what a lot of things were. He didn't know what the fair was. Yeah. Now he knows what the fair is and he can go to it. I have to do everyday mom stuff. So when we did go to the grocery store, he didn't really know grocery stores had toy sections or video game sections. We would avoid all of those. Um, so... If he did happen to see something that was desirable, that was just not attainable, I guess, um, he would have a full-blown physical meltdown. I would have to restrain him. Basically, being sit me and him on the floor in the middle of the grocery store until he calmed down. As long as it takes, I mean, up to an hour, like I, I couldn't go anywhere on a time frame because there was, I always had to be ready for a meltdown, be ready for the extra time because you just have to wait it out. Like I said, me leaving the house or someone leaving the house or even he's so social that, that when someone would come over and then have to leave, it was huge. Um, that's doing things that he didn't want to do. Um, typical kid stuff like brushing teeth and taking baths and stuff like that. <laughs> Scary. And I didn't believe it for rewarding a child for being bad. Um, but I also understood the process of... Um, learning to tolerate things that are not comfortable. I love the process. Um, that I'm able to go places with Jaden. He's able to tolerate things. About a year to a year and a half. It was, that was probably the major change, but there was slow, slow changes in between that year, year and a half. Pretty much anywhere with preparation. Um, I can go to multiple grocery stores with Jaden, multiple stores with toys. We can look in the toy aisle and not go home with a toy. Um, we can go to the fair. We can pretty much do anything. <laughs> um, when I was probably comfortable with it, like because it's all about pushing myself as well. I know Jaden could go to one store, but how much? In my tolerance bank, did I have to keep going before I knew that limit was reached and I, I knew it wasn't going to be possible to go anymore. But I always want to push myself and I always want to push Jaden. Yeah. So Jaden's always seen Ferris wheels and fairs on TV and in books and stuff. So we were able to go one year uh, to the fair and he had a successful day. There were challenges during the day. 
um, but they were able to be talked through and worked through and continue through the rest of the day at the fair. Like I have a normal life again. Um, I can go do things without worrying about the planning that goes into doing something. Um, Time-wise, I can run in and out of the store quickly. Um, I can go to people's houses and not have to stress that he's going to tear the place up. I always said that why can't he join a normal class with some help? And that was never really an option. Um, he can do everything that anybody else can in the school with a small assistance now. Um, he's happier. Um, trust the process. That's, that's all I have to say. Trust, trust the process and be open-minded to different ways of doing stuff because if you're still in the, in the place where you started or not very far from where you started, what can a change hurt?